That's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good afternoon. You never hear me saying that. Uh, Liz McAvill and myself, <laughs> we run live streams. It's always 9 a.m. West Coast time for me. So I'm always saying good morning to everybody. So this is definitely a little bit different for being in the afternoon. But thank you so much for joining us. I know it's like evening for some, I think middle of the night for internationals. So thank you for joining us from wherever you're at. Uh, usually it's not me. It's I think it's Ethan. Uh, we have uh, Darlene Davis, I think, sometimes ho host them. We have uh, Katie, Uma, different people. So welcome afternoon people. I'm always talking to people in the morning or midday. So it's really, really good to have everybody here. As always, we love to find out where you're from. Oh, hi, just me. Um, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, whoa, my face just got really big. Um, very unsightly. Never do that again. Uh, let us know where you're from. We love, we love always kind of finding out. I mean, this is such an international community. This is a national, uh, uh, I mean, an international, um, you know, live stream. And I love seeing people joining us from all over and also just offering support. And I always like seeing in the comments when somebody's like, oh my God, I'm from there too. How is it going? So we already got some people uh, saying hi. We got some Athens, Georgia. We got Seattle. So hello, everyone. <laughs> so before I jump in with introductions and what this live stream is about, is we always have a couple announcements. We want to kind of just start off right. So remind you that this live stream is educational and is not intended to replace therapy. So for, uh, for treatment related questions, please work with your provider or contact local clinician. As always, how I found my therapist those years ago, you can go to the IOCDF's online resource directory at iocdf.org slash find dash help to find a local trained clinician near you. There's also treatment centers on there. There's psychiatrists, there's um, uh, support groups, there's so many different, um, there's affiliates, there's uh, all these different things that the resource directory lets you know about. So make sure to check it out. Uh, but we're also not a crisis hotline. So, uh, you know, make sure if you're in a crisis or you're ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room or call 911 or the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988. You can also go to 988lifeline.org. And then lastly, we want to create a safe space and be kind and respectful to everyone. So at the end of the day, we're all here to support one another. And a note that this is being recorded and broadcast on several media platforms. Uh, the other things you want to make sure at the end to join us for the last announcements, but um, we have some uh, exciting things coming up like the kids conference. We'll tell you more about that at the end. Uh, welcome Sandy from uh, Ontario and snowy Wisconsin is where uh, Amy's from. We have Mike who says hi. We have uh, England in the house. So that's always exciting. So let me tell you a little bit about the topic and then I'll introduce our guests. So as you know, uh, one of the, I call it kind of like the cornerstones of the IOCF. I don't even know if that's the right word, but one of the central components is the other thing that came to mind. So I kind of picked out the two is uh, the IOCF has some amazing conferences. And I think if you've looked on the website, there's more conferences than ever. And I think a lot of times people don't recognize that they can be a part of the conferences. You watching this can be part of the conferences. There's so many ways to get involved as a presenter, as a speaker, as somebody that runs support groups. So that's really what we're going to talk about for the next 90 minutes here at this town hall is just educating everybody a little bit about how you can join the conferences, how you can have a role at them, and what it's like to submit for it. And sometimes people feel like it's intimidating, so we're going to dispel all that. So today, we're going to be talking about how to submit a proposal from one of the upcoming conferences. And I'm glad I don't have to do it alone. So I have two very special guests. So I'm going to first introduce the IOCF's program director, Steph Kogan, who's been a, like, staple at the conference, I mean, at the uh, foundation for a long time. Very welcomed and familiar mm -hmm. face. But I think a lot of people see her smiling at the conferences and don't know the hours of behind the scenes, which I've gotten a glimpse of with her, uh, is a lot. So Steph is really um, the uh, kind of the, the person, the go-to person to make these conferences happen. Um, and for her, she wants to let y'all know what the conference is looking for. So I'm really happy to have her on here joining us from the East Coast. So Steph, welcome, welcome. How you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So excited to to be here, to be talking conference, to be here with you, Chris, and you, Jesse. It's, it's that time of year. It's always exciting and can't wait to see what we come up with this year. I know. And it's always exciting to get you on a live. When we were talking about this behind the scenes, I was like, Amanda, get Steph. I need her on this live. She's perfect for it. So Amanda like messaged me back. I was like, she's going to do it. So I was really excited. Did I forget anything um, in my intro of you? No, that was a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. 
Uh, and I'm really excited to, uh, to introduce our next guest. Uh, one of the things that I think about the IOCF, one of the flourishing components of the IOCF is all this young adult programming, young adult community that's a build. And Jesse Birnbaum, you have been such a central part to it. I've seen your face on the live, uh, the Instagram lives. I also know that you've been really active in speaking and proposing and also, um, you know, just at the, uh, I don't know what you call it, like bi-monthly, right? That means twice a month. Yeah. Because sometimes you'll say bi-weekly. We'll go for it. I was like, but bi-weekly, does that mean twice a week or like every, yeah. But anyways, every other week, uh, the young adults have a really cool um, uh, meetup, virtual meetup. And Jesse's a big part of that. Um, so a person with OCD who's been giving back and making sure um, young adults have a place, a soft place to land. So Jesse, we're excited to have you on. Do you want to introduce yourself? Anything that I totally missed or our butcher? No, no, you you got it all correct. Uh, yeah, we actually have a meetup tomorrow night, so I'll, I'll shout that out. Um, and I also run the um, Chronic Illness and Disability Special Interest Group, which holds a very dear place in my heart. Yeah, and what I think is so cool is like that's an example, Jesse, of like how you've gotten involved. Obviously, we're going to be talking conference specific, but I think sometimes um, you know people don't realize that there's so many ways to get involved with the foundation. So you're. Uh, you're a shining example of that. So thanks. All right, everyone. So where I would like to start, I'll, I'll start with you first, Steph, and then you could jump in, Jesse. You know, the the conferences, when I know when I first attended them, it felt like something out there. And it wasn't until later on, after attending many of them, I was like, oh, you can speak, you can be, you know, uh, engage in stuff. So maybe to back it up a little bit, Steph, tell us a little bit about what conferences. I think people know, obviously, the the in-person conference, but there's so much more. So can you tell us a little bit about the conferences and then maybe which ones people can get involved in with presentations and which ones are more for, for attending? Of course, yeah. So, you know, kind of and prior to the pandemic, we only did the one in-person annual OCD conference. And so, you know, one of the silver linings of this pandemic we've all lived through these past several years is that we did make the pivot to virtual. And that's where we've really seen this conference scene flourish. So I'll go chronologically just because that's how my brain works. Um, so the first one of the year, Chris alluded to it in his little intro, is going to be our online OCD camp for youth and their families. That is going to take place at the end of the month. And that is geared towards youth of all ages from, you know, all the way down to our little elementary schoolers up to our high schoolers and then their families. And um, that's a really fun weekend, a lot of fun interactive activities, a lot of learning, but even more just fun and connection and socializing. It's one of my favorite weekends that we do. Um, after that will be our actually new this year BDD conference, which is going to be online as well. Uh, this is the first time we're doing it. We're so excited. Chris has been such an instrumental part, him and the BDD special interest group. Um, it's thanks to them and their amazing advocacy that this is getting off the ground and we're so excited for it. Um, that's going to be a one day conference that is, I believe, primarily geared towards clinicians and those treating OC uh, BDD. But then there's also going to be a component for those affected by BDD personally as well as, I believe, family members as well. Um, but of course, please correct me if I'm wrong there, Chris. No, you're right. Um, We're going to kind of do it like simultaneously. So there'll be stuff for people with BDD, their family, loved ones, and then, of course, clinicians that want to learn more and get more training. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm super excited for that one. People have been wanting it for years, and it's finally happening. 2024 Saturday, is March 16th. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so then after that will be our Faith and OCD conference, um, which that is during the week. Um, well, the rest of these are mostly on weekends, uh, but that one is for people of all faith traditions who live with OCD and want to kind of have that special space for connection specifically around navigating those faith spaces with their OCD. It's also for uh, faith leaders, uh, those who, you know, maybe lead a congregation or a worship or a temple or whatever word applies to your faith tradition, uh, as well as mental health professionals who want to learn how to, you know, integrate people whose faith is important to them, integrate those, you know, either working with the faith leaders or just making sure that it's, you know, respectfully and mindfully and joyfully integrated into the OCD treatment. After that will be the online hoarding disorder conference, uh, which is again, also going to be in May. And that is for people who have hoarding disorder as well as for their loved ones, as well as for mental health professionals and community-based professionals. So folks who maybe don't do mental health treatment, but they do, you know, maybe they're a case manager or they work in protective services or housing authorities. 
So we bring a lot of other folks who maybe we don't normally think about when it comes to OCD or BDD, but they're instrumental and so vital in the hoarding disorder um, community and process. And then we come to our, what we're largely going to be here talking about today, our in-person annual OCD conference, which always takes place over the summer, usually in July. Sometimes it tips into August, but usually it's entirely in July. Uh, this year, it's going to be in Orlando, Florida in the very end of July. Um, and so that is a wonderful, 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 really unique, to be honest. There's not a lot of conferences that are like it where we bring together everyone in our amazing OCD community. It's not only for professionals. It's not only for folks with a lived experience or only for family members. Everyone is together, living, learning, having fun, hopefully, <laughs> together. So um, that's three days. And then we also have a component for researchers as well. Uh, including the day before the conference, we have a research symposium. So, and that is for researchers by researchers. So, and then there's a lot of content about research updates and best practices and things like that throughout the conference itself, of course, but there's that special pre-day just for the researchers. And then after that, we will get to our Spanish language conference or a conferencia de talk online, which is for those who speak Spanish, who have OCD, who treat OCD, or who our families or loved ones of someone with OCD. That is usually in the fall, usually September. And then finally, and I hope I haven't forgotten anything because that will be a little embarrassing for me, but I will move through it if I have, um, is our online OCD conference, which this year I believe is going to be later in November. Um, and so that is kind of a, a little bit more of a compressed version of the annual OCD conference. It serves and involves the same audiences, but it's a little bit shorter. It's two days. It's also virtual. Um, and due to the timing, there's less, there's fewer time slots. So there are, it's, yeah, I think a miniature version of the annual OCD conference is just a good way to talk about it. Um, but yeah, as you can hear, kind of the common thread through all of these is we really try to engage everyone in our OCD community at some point to the best of our ability. Um, and in that vein, we firmly ascribe to the nothing about you without you theory that uh, you may have heard in other spaces. So uh, we really invite people, no matter who you are, to submit to speak, to be, you know, be a part of our review committees, to volunteer, to attend, to join. There's not really a, you know, a hierarchy for lack of, I don't want to confuse the word hierarchy here when we're talking if the case ERP ends up coming up, but there's not really a I don't know what a good word is for it, but it's no matter who you are, we welcome you and we invite you and we want you to be involved. So um, I know sometimes if this is the first time we're even considering thinking about a conference that can maybe feel a little scary or a little intimidating, totally valid. I totally understand that. And I strongly encourage you to challenge that intimidation and that that fear you may have. And please come join because it's so much fun and we'd love to have you involved. Beautiful. Uh, Emily at 7-Eleven, I always have to remember the time change. Uh, Emily at 7-Eleven uh, is a, a mental health professional asked, uh, if you could put the question on the screen, Brennan, is there a handout or a page on the website where we can find all these upcoming events listed, times and dates? So Steph, where should people go if they wanna find out about all those different events? Um, uh, like yeah, Emily. absolutely. I'm gonna pop, I don't think I have chat access, but I will I will have it our little back chat and then maybe uh, Brennan, I can have Brennan, um, who's being our amazing support here, pop it on the front end chat. But I believe it is just iocdf.org slash conferences. So um, yes, it looks like that is close enough. So I will give that to you, Brennan, in a moment, and then that will be readily available to you all. Um, but yes, that's I know I spewed a lot of information at you all, so no worries about that. Yeah, so a lot of really good conferences. We're still getting some shout outs. Exposure movie, go watch it. Really good film on OCD. It said hi, Phyllis. Um, we got a shout out uh, for the chronic illness interest group from Matt uh, and a bunch of different people. Um, yeah, so how exciting. I mean, Steph, just li you listed just a bunch of good ones and we'll jump into, you know, the one that has the submissions open right now, the in-person, which I love, by the way, Florida in July is going to kill all of us who don't know what humidity is. So I'm like, mm -hmm. whenever I tell people like, oh, I'm going to this place in July for a conference or like Atlanta in a July, but um, good thing is air conditioning is is our friend. So we'll be good. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not to be devious, but maybe if it's just too hot outside, you're going to stay inside where all the conference fun is. Exactly. Exactly. I know when I see people going to like uh, Disney World uh, in Florida, I just think like, don't you melt 
like <laughs> doesn't the like roller coaster just like melt to the the track and you're done like but yeah the, the good thing is it's always at night the the conference is always at big hotels and it's always really really nice uh to get that air conditioning um before we jump into to that we have another question from amy at 714 brennan can people without a professional membership to the iocf sign up for the research symposium so who can yeah, we yeah nothing about our we don't um you don't need to be a member to be involved in any of this i think if you are a member you do get a little bit of a discount as kind of a benefit of your membership but there's no requirement to be a member to participate in any of our conference programming um i think the only thing about the research symposium specifically is it is truly geared towards researchers so if you are not a researcher maybe think a little bit about whether that's the right space for you a lot of the same info will be um presented in maybe a more accessible way as part of the conference itself versus the research symposium but no membership requirement yeah. okay cool um so i'll throw it open first uh steph so right now the submission process is open for the in-person conference that's going to be happening in Orlando until I believe January 29th. Am I mm -hmm. correct? Or, okay. Correct. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Like it's open, like how do people access it? What does that kind of look like? Yeah. So we, you know, in the page that we just sent, if you click through to the information about the annual OCD conference, it's the one with the beautiful logo that has a little bit of an orange on it. We're kind of playing on that orange theme this year. Um, you'll you'll see information about the proposal system. And you know, to answer your first question about what does that mean, it means we're, we're basically putting an open call out into the world for folks to send in ideas for what they think they wanna see at the conference and particularly what they would wanna speak about. So it's not necessarily a place to say, hey, I think this would be a good topic. Let me send that along because this is truly for if you're ready to step up and say, yes, this is a good idea and I'm the one to speak about it, possibly with some of my colleagues or my friends or my family members. Uh, if you are someone who maybe doesn't want to speak but has a good idea, shoot us an email with that idea and we'll keep it in mind and we'll prioritize that when we're setting the program. So the proposal system is really for people who are ready to take that step and say, I'm going to, I want to speak, I want to put my story out there or I want to put this cool treatment I've been doing out there. I want to tell my story. I want to teach my colleagues about a cool, you know, new treatment modality I've been trying. I want to talk about how I've been modifying to work with folks who have OCD and some sort of other comorbidity or disorder or whatever it may be. Um, that's what the proposal system is for. And the only requirement in that vein is that you are ready to speak. So it doesn't, you don't have to be a professional. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to have a million fancy degrees after your name. You just have to be prepared to speak to all your fellow conference attendees about whatever, whatever your topic might be. Well, I have some more questions for you, Steph, but I want to throw Jesse in the mix. And I actually think there's a great question to launch what I was going to ask you, Jesse. So at 716, Brennan, Brittany wrote, I hope that one day after suffering from OCD for 35 years, I can eventually gain the confidence and bravery to share my story, provide any help I can for others. Though I'm still very much looking help for myself. So why don't you talk, you know, Brittany, both the, you and I have lived experience and have uh, participated at this conference. Like, I want to go back a little bit. Like, what did it take for you as a person with OCD to say, like, look, I'm going to do it? Because I hear that from so many people reach out to me. And the biggest thing I get is like, hey, I want to share my story, but I'm scared or I don't think I have anything to offer or I'm not like, you know, like in remission fully, like how did you get the confidence to to submit or what was it that made you motivated to, to put in a proposal? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I really like what you said, Steph, about like not needing to have a million like fancy degrees because I have zero fancy degree. Oh, I guess I have a bachelor's degree, but other than that, not really any fancy degrees to my name um, and had not really had really any experience with the IOCDF when I first submitted um, for the in-person conference. And it's actually the online conference that gave me the courage to um, submit the proposal. I had seen, like, had been following, like, the live streams and all the stuff online and really wanted to go in person and was pretty afraid to. So I didn't go to the conference in Denver, which I, I now haven't gone. I'm, like, slapping myself for. Um, but I saw that there was the online conference after that, and I was like, you know what, this is more doable. You know, I could do it from my couch. Um, I could have my camera off by the last day. You know, my camera is on. I'm like texting people. Um, but it was such an incredible experience, like even just online, not having met any of these people in person. Mm -hmm. It's 
remarkable. It's like hard to put into words, like how magical it is. Um, and after that, I was like, I have to go to this in-person conference. And I think personally, I'm lucky in that I'm more extroverted and feel comfortable in sharing my story. But I know someone who I presented with wasn't that way. And it, it does. It takes a lot of courage to get up there, to share your story, to speak in front of a lot of people. Um, and I think it's really the community and the support that I got from the online conference, meeting people at that conference. I was amazed that you could really like form relationships from a three day virtual event. Um, and those relationships, I think, really got me and this friend of mine who, you know, wasn't as extroverted to really feel confident in wanting to uh, submit a proposal and really wanting to speak at the in-person conference. Well said, I think that that's what it takes is just getting that courage and just recognizing that you have something to say, something to share. People will hear your story and feel inspired. Steph, what are some of the things that people can submit for for the in-person conference? So if they want to speak in Orlando in July, uh, what are some of the topics or what are some of the, not topics, what are some of the categories or opportunities that they can either speak or get involved with as a presenter? Yeah, of course. So we, the conference itself is three days, technically two and a half, I think, if you're counting hours, but it's three days. And during the day, we have educational workshops, which are kind of your more traditional, what you would expect from a conference, where the talks are around a topic of some sort. It's a bunch of panelists usually speaking about either their experience, their personal experience, or as you know, a professional or a researcher doing the work in the field. Um, or you know, we have family members as well. We always love when we have the family members and the siblings sharing their perspective because that's just so vital. So we have the educational workshops is one. Uh, support groups is another. Uh, so typically in the past, they have always taken place in the evening. But this year, for the first time, we're actually going to have lunchtime support groups as well. So there's going to be kind of two opportunities during the day for support. And the support groups are more of a place for people to find connection and community. Some of that does happen in the talks as well, um, you know, in the way Jesse was alluding to earlier. But that is the express purpose of the support groups, whereas the talks are more about learning and, you know, achieving some sort of learning or educational goal. Um, the support groups, that's where people can connect around, whether it's an aspect of their identity, a specific subtype of OCD that they deal with, living with a comorbid condition of some sort. Um, you know, if they are a parent, we do support groups for parents of youth of all ages, things like that. And, you know, again, with the support groups, the goal really is connection and community and, you know, finding support and um, engaging with one another around whatever the topic may be. And then the third type of uh, proposal we accept is for activities, which that's where the fun can happen. Not that fun doesn't happen in a support group or an educational activity, but um, or the educational workshop, excuse me. But the activities are really just about, you know, we have had art activities, we've had game nights. Sometimes there's almost nothing to do with OCD except for the fact that it's taking place at an OCD conference. Um, so that's where, you know, let your imagination run wild. Whatever you can dream, we can, you know, please feel free to submit. We've had things like runs and walks, depending on maybe maybe that's less appropriate for Florida if it's going to be so hot, uh, maybe more of a walk than a run, for example. But it's just a way to get out there and have fun, to meet others in kind of a lower pressure environment where you can just show up as you are. You don't have to feel, feel the need to share. You don't feel the need to learn. It's just there to have fun and connect. Um, so those are the three types, the educational workshops, the support groups, and the activities. Um, and most of the activities do play, take place in the evening, so we do tend to call them evening activities. Um, and then, so all of those, no matter which of those you do, we consider you a speaker. So it's not only the folks who speak on the educational workshops that are called speakers. Running a support group counts as being a speaker. Running an awesome art activity counts as being a speaker. So it's kind of an equal opportunity between those three these those three categories. Yeah. And uh, the next question I'm going to ask you again, Steph, and then Jesse, I want to get kind of like your insider perspective. When people go to submit a proposal, I think, you know, some people may have submitted in the past, it didn't get selected, um, or people don't are kind of lost on what, what makes a good proposal? Like what is, what is, because there's a lot of people that, that have a say in which talks get picked. There's committees, there's people, right? What, what do you feel is the right way to propose something so that it kind of stands above the rest and has a more likely chance that it might get selected? Yeah, I think that depends on 
which type of, of those three categories you're doing. I think the one rule that applies no matter which is more detail, the better. So we, you know, as part of if you, you've started the process or maybe you're still thinking about it, as part of what we want you to do as part of your proposal is you write a description of your activity. And in that description, we do limit the amount of characters. So it's one of those little exercises of, okay, I need to get across my point within the limited number of characters. But we also have a spot for extra information and additional information that's not really going to appear in any sort of material. You know, it won't include it in the online schedule. Or it won't be included in the program guide, anything like that. But if you're still thinking that we need more detail about what exactly your educational workshop, your support group, your activity is going to involve, that's your spot to just tell us everything to make sure we have the full picture. So whichever of those you're doing, I think just as much detail and specificity as you can provide, the better. Um, for those of you who may be interested in sharing your stories, we actually have a specific tag you can pick called personal stories. And once you pick that, we have a series of questions that we want you to go through where you just tell us about yourself and we kind of guide you through how to share your story. So it's not just a paragraph and you have to pick what's most important to you to share. We have these specific questions for you to answer. And again, the more detail you can give us, the better, because uh, sometimes we get proposals that are, you know, a single sentence or a sentence or two. And it's a little hard to know what to do with that, because it's hard to understand what exactly they're trying to achieve or what they're hoping attendees will get out of their talk. Um, so the more detail, the better. And then just be authentic. Don't feel like you have to be anything that you're not. Um, if, or if you're someone who's wanting to share a personal experience or a story, who you are is just who we want. And you are the expert in your own experiences. So please don't feel like you need to, you know, change that or embellish that or anything about that. And then for those who may be, you know, at the mental health professionals or the, the researchers, um, you know, again, I think the more, the more detailed and the more specific you are, the better. I think that's always helpful. And, you know, going back to what makes our conference so unique is bringing all these audiences together. We love when talks do that as well. So when there's you know, if we have a panel of maybe four therapists versus a panel of a therapist, someone with a lived experience, their family member, and maybe a psychiatrist or a different type of professional, that's going to be such a compelling panel when we have these various perspectives that are going to talk about whatever the topic is. Um, so, you know, as you're building your panels or as you're thinking about this, think about who you might be able to bring along with you who maybe has a different perspective than you or has a different aspect of whatever the topic to share. Um, so that's always, I think, makes elevates a proposal a little bit as well. Well, I love the the last one that you said, because I know for me, I mean, I liked all your points, but I know for me, as somebody that's been attending the conference for a while, I think I learned so much when there's a variety of perspectives mm -hmm. on a panel mm -hmm. and, the, and, you know, having multiple people talk on a panel. There was a really compelling talk um, that I think did really well at the online conference, for instance, where uh, Marisa Maza had uh, a client and really acted out what it's like to do act, acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and there's just something about watching it in action. Um, I, I always think that having like, you know, that kind of dynamic for you, Jesse, like when you have gotten your talks, um, you know, accepted, like, what do you think it was about your talks, your proposal process? Like, tell me a little bit about the mindset that you're in when you put forth a talk um, for the conference. Yeah, I think something, too, that I really wanted to bring up that Steph, you've mentioned as well, is that you really don't have to have this again, like those accolades. Um, I know when I submitted for the in-person conference in San Francisco, you know, I hadn't really been involved very much. And um, my friend and I who started the chronic illness SIG later on knew we really wanted to bring something. We had noticed there was so much overlap between OCD and chronic illness that hadn't really been talked about a lot. A lot of people who had also had these experiences but we didn't have a clinician that we knew that was going to, you know, be a part of this talk. And we knew the two of us weren't just going to get up there and start talking about chronic illness and OCD. And we ended up just emailing different clinicians um, that we found online. Um, we had someone put out a little plug for us and then kind of cold called, and like kind of started emailing people. Um, and the response was incredible. We got so many different, we thought it would be the opposite where like we'd have to be like searching for people. And it was the opposite where people were really interested. And again, we didn't know any of these people beforehand. Um, and we would do like a little Zoom call and meet them. 
Um, and finding people where, you know, you both really seem to like jive well, or you have the same interests. Um, so we tried to make it. So we had, you know, a clinician, um, our clinician also had lived experience with OCD. Um, and then we both had lived experience with OCD and we really wanted to bring a talk that, um, hadn't really been discussed before. So I think that was something else that kind of had its own little unique, um, unique spin there. Well, one thing that that Steph said, and maybe you could kind of bounce off what I'm about to say, Jesse, but I, you know, about the detail that goes into it. I know for me, like when I put my proposals together, I'm like, it's like an event, you know, it's definitely <laughs> not like a five minute thing. Like I'm really thinking it out. I'm cutting stuff out. I'm putting it through Grammarly. I'm trying to get that. because I, I really think what it, what it is, I, I think not only for obviously the people picking the proposal, but if it gets selected, this is what people are going to read to see if this talk is interesting enough for them to come in. And so what you're really trying to show people is like, this is going to be an experience. This is going to be something that you're going to attend and really like walk away, you know, with something new. And so like one of the talks that I was really proud of um, last talk, uh, last conference was a talk that we did more so it was more of a talk that I felt like people wanted that wasn't OCD specific, but it was about, you know, how to utilize exercise, diet, mindfulness, mm -hmm. meditation, sleep hygiene, um, support system, et cetera, in order to really help reduce stress and to navigate and, and to, to level out some of that anxiety that we have, because in turn that will support OCD. And it was really like, I was like, how in the world am I going to get that across? That's a lot, right? And so I do hope that what people are watching this is it's like, you know your topic, but the 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 uh, the the committee that's selecting it doesn't, and then the people if it does get selected that are reading the program they don't know your talk. So if you kind of write it in a way that you know but they don't, so you really got to showcase to people like this is why this is a slot that's needed. This is something that they really have to get. So maybe Jesse to expand on that, like when you were you know because because I would say that. Uh, doing talks, for instance, on OCD and chronic illness is kind of new frontier, right? What was specifically in the process, the logistics that you felt got across to the committee, and then eventually the attendees like, hey, this is what you'll get from our talk? Well, it's so funny that you said like the Grammarly and all that stuff, because when we went to submit, we did like, you have the rough draft and then rough draft number two and then rough <laughs> draft final and then, you know, final draft. And um, I know even now for this year, when we're um, going to submit a proposal, we've had like two Zooms, we have a Zoom scheduled. Um, and I think Zoom, honestly, and like meeting, I don't know if you'll do this, Chris, when you submit. I always do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so great because then you make sure you're on the same page. And um, I know we had a Zoom recently where um, we were trying to come up with a new um, proposal and trying to come up with a catchy name too. I feel like catchy names also help. Um, that takes a while. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that was part of rough draft number two. Um, so we're like coming up with it. And then when you're on Zoom and you're, you know, talking with others who have the same passion and same idea, it tends to bring out more ideas than mm. that you're able to incorporate into the proposal. Um, but I know we have like multiple different variations and it's definitely, as you were saying, a work in progress where it's not just like a five minute thing. It's something that, you know, you're taking your time doing. And one thing, Steph, I'd like you to expand on, I think, you know, one thing that I saw over the years is a lot of the talks now have components. So what I mean by that is there might be role plays, there might be breakouts, people might be getting in small groups, there might be like a written activity. Um, is that maybe expand on like when people are going to do a proposal? A little bit about like workshopping or engagement or things like that like why is that important and why do those talks seem to be better received and how can people kind of implement that in their uh proposal peer uh proposal process rather yeah no i think that i think i'm absolutely loving this trend of adding the components i love that word too let's keep using it um because i think because people actually can involve themselves in the talk it just becomes that much more meaningful and impactful and it's even, you know, I don't want to get too nerdy about it, but it's even helpful for internalizing and learning a new concept or a new skill or a new whatever it may be. Actually getting to practice it live is just so powerful for your ability to continue doing that long after the weekend ends. Um, and that's not, I'm not trying to 
uh, you know, poo poo our traditional learning from a slideshow or didactic lectures and things like that. Of course, that still happens. And of course, that still has a place and is important. But when you're actually letting people start to do it, or start to see it, like the talk you mentioned at the online OCD conference, where it was truly a therapist in session with her client going through these activities. Um, we'd see a lot of role play at the conference as well. Um, and just the more experiential it is, I think the more engaged people feel and the more engaged they feel, the better they're gonna rate it, the better they're gonna think about it, the more they're gonna remember your talk after the conference weekend ends. We often hear that, you know, we joke it's a good problem to have, but people feel, like there's maybe too many things that they want to do. And, you know, this just can be sometimes an overwhelming experience being there and learning so many new things. It often feels like you're, it's like a tidal wave of information and experiences and feelings and new people and all, and new experiences and all that. But if people have practiced, that's already one step further to maintaining whatever that information, skill, practice, whatever it may be after the weekend ends. Um, so, I just think people like to be involved, you know, and, it, you know, we have five blocks of sessions a day. Nobody wants to sit for five, it's actually more than five hours. It ends up being about eight hours. Um, just sit there and, you know, be talked at without the chance to, you know, reflect or to practice or to be involved in whatever the session is. Um, and I will say for, I hadn't, I didn't really touch on earlier, but we have youth programming at the annual OCD conference as well. So I know we have our camp at the end of the month, but we also invite our, our lovely little youth to the annual OCD conference. And if you are wanting to speak in the youth programming, we require you are experiential. So we require that there's an activity uh, for the youth to participate in as part of whatever your workshop is. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was thinking about like, that's always been something that I'm trying to incorporate. And I was thinking like, you know, we did a talk with the other, I did a talk with the other lead and national advocates about like OCD in the media. And it's like, we played mm. clip video that people could watch. And then everybody on their smartphones were able to kind of like comment on that or for that talk on anxiety reduction, Krista Reed, who was like an incredible speaker, by the way, um, she had people doing chair yoga and mindfulness. I think my mom shared her recipe for um, black bean brownies, which by the way, my mom is a dietitian. So every Thing like that. That's what I painfully grew up with. My I painfully grew like, up on that too. You did? Yeah. My mom's a registered it's dietitian. LA life. Yeah. It's the LA life. And then having yeah. a mom who's a registered dietitian, it was like great. Yeah. But my mom was like sharing recipes that people could cook that are like, uh, you know, that are, that have been shown to help with the gut brain biome and really help with, with anxiety reduction or um, and Scott Granite and I did like a BDD CBT workshop where people could bring in their clients and we could work it out for you, Jesse, as an attendee. Uh, and the reason I brought this up, by the way, is because I think that's going to if you're watching this and you feel like you haven't gotten your talk accepted or you're about to submit, think of that. How can you get the audience involved? Like people want mm -hmm. to learn from you and they want to engage with you. And I think that even though there is a place for obviously talks that are, are more educational based, especially maybe in the clinical um, uh, tracks, but I think that there's people want to practice. Clinicians want to role play as if they have a client there, etc. For you, Jesse, like, do some of those talks seem to to resonate with you, or what about talks that you're like, okay, if people are proposing right now, they got to include this. This is really good to attend for. Oh yeah, and I'm not just saying it because you mentioned it and it was your talk, but I remember attending that one with the lead advocates and. Um, it was, it felt like the whole group was there together because people were writing like really funny responses. Um, I, I don't remember what the poll thing was called, but like oh, people were writing, program. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. People were writing like responses on their phone and everyone was like laughing together. It felt very much like a shared experience. I remember too, one of my favorite talks was, it was Ethan Smith and then Dr. Moritz and Dr. Hoffman had like a, aha moment talk um and towards the end they had people come up towards the center they had like a microphone and people were sharing their aha moment and like i still remember this one guy who came up and um kind of shared that he had never disclosed his ocd and then when someone asked him where he was that weekend he said i'm at an ocd conference and it was just like it, it takes your breath away like it was absolutely incredible um, and everyone who shared in that line, it, you know, really stood out. So it was cool to hear the expert perspective and then to also hear like what the people in the audience were thinking as well. Yeah. 
No, I love that, like where people can come up and share too. Because mm -hmm. it makes, I, I think for some of them, it's the first time that they've been in a room with other people with OCD. So just to be able to get feedback and hear from them, I think it's incredible. Yeah. I wanted to move a little bit real quick before uh, we do that. There's a comment and I, I know we announced it, so this isn't secret, but um, at uh, 716 Brennan, Stephen asks anything in, I don't know what Kinkaki is, or Chicago, but we're going to Chicago, right, Steph? We are in, oh gosh, math. <laughs> 2025, right? No, uh, I, you know, I'm actually, I'm just gonna have to go through the whole next slate. So 2025 okay. is going to be, no, you're right. It is Chicago 2025. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so this, this is why my brain works. I can't recall, <laughs> but if I go through it. So yes, 2025 will be in Chicago. 2026 will be in Seattle. And 2027 will be in New York City. And 2028, we are still finalizing. Yeah. So I hope, Stephen, you'll join us in Orlando. Um, but if you can't, we hope to see you in Chicago. Chicago has been a popular one because we've been there a couple of times. And let me tell you, I'm never mad because that deep dish pizza. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. It does take like I'm an, it takes them like an hour and 20 minutes to make it for for goodness sakes, but it's good. And fun fact, and Liz McAvill will be annoyed by this, but it's the largest Greek population in the United States. And so you can get some legit Greek food um, yeah, in Chicago. So you got to join us, Stephen. Uh, Amy at, at 717 says, I have a research background and co-run a research and education OCD support group with an OCD researcher. That's why I'm interested. Amy, come to those. I mean, I, I had a, a client that I worked with who went to some of the research posters at the conference um, and just was just fascinating about the research component. So I always think that um, Steph is right. Like if it's not really your thing, there's definitely talks more suited for you. But if you do like Amy have a research background or super, super into research, um, please go ahead and check the research stuff out because mm -hmm. some really, really good stuff, some top stuff. So that's good. Um, okay, I wanted to jump into specific topics. So I'll let both of y'all jump in. And then I know we have a blog with some, but what are some of the topics that either do really well each year? What are some of the 101s that people could submit? Or what are some like exciting things that are on the horizon that we hope um, people will submit? I'll start with you, Steph, and then maybe Jesse, like what are some of the topics that you want or hope people submit this year? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, this year we, you may, if you've already looked at the proposal system, you may already have noticed this, but one of the ones we have a special uh, interest in having more talks about is access to care. Um, and so that can be from multiple angles. So both what think about communities who maybe are underserved traditionally, you know, our racial and ethnic minority groups, our, uh, our seniors, folks who live in rural places, places that, you know, we, it basically, if you're not living in a big city, if you're not white, if you're not rich, how are you getting your care? So we have a special interest this year in talks that focus on that from all sides. So whether it's someone sharing your experience of how they've navigated that situation in their own life or in that of a loved one, if you're someone who researches this and has suggestions for how to improve access to care, uh, if you're a therapist who has been doing something really cool in your practice to increase the amount of and the types and the situations and settings in which you're able to offer care, um, all of that is kind of a special area of focus for us this year. Um, I think anything about, you know, we we always get, you know, we're, we always make sure as the annual OCD conference to cover kind of the basics about what OCD is and how it's treated. But I think some of the the talks that people get super excited about every year are kind of the special, whether it's a subtype you don't often hear talked about a lot or a, a comorbidity that maybe complicates OCD or changes how we have to treat it because of the comorbidity. Um, things like that are always super well attended and uh, super asked for in the evaluations. Um, and then I think just, I, I always think the evening activities and the support groups are underrated. So I always think people should think about if there's anything they have an interest in doing in those, because that's where so much of the community and connection and the fun happens as part of the conference. So I always, I always urge people to think about those when they're thinking about their um, proposals and they can be about anything. I think with what you touched on too is I think the support groups are also a really good place for subtypes. You know, there's other people that have never been with another person that has very taboo thoughts around sexual or um, harm OCD. Or I think 
Uh, relationship OCD is a big one where a support group would absolutely kill it. Uh, we obviously have to shout out John Grayson's OCD walk, like Matthew mentioned, for evening activities. But I think like when people can do stuff together like that, um, I know social anxiety groups are always great because they're the first people around that. Or I think, you know, people with sexual orientation, o OCD or gender identity, OCD, I just think, or scrupulosity where people are religious mm -hmm. and really struggling with balancing their faith and OCD. So I think all of those can be great. How about for you, Jesse? Like what, what do you either like have seen and you're like, please come back or what are some like topics that you're like super, super excited about that, that you hope people submit? Okay, I don't know if this is like, if I'm allowed to share this, Kyle King might get mad at me, but uh, <laughs> he's already probably, it's fine. Um, but he was um, writing a lot of the ideas for the young adult track um, for um, Orlando. And there are some really cool ones. Um, one was about like parents, um, like relationship with parents when you have OCD. Um, another one was suicidal obsessions, with which mm -hmm. often don't get talked about, um, mm -hmm. and then different um, modalities when it comes to like DBT and ACT and stuff like that. So um, I'm really excited for those. I think for me, like as a person with lived experience, the talks that I'm always excited about and I really hope um, come out is just the raw ones. I mean, you kind of mentioned it, Jesse, with like suicidal ideations, but I know Matt um, Bannister put in the chat like visual Tourette OCD, for instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, that can be very, very shameful and embarrassing um, because of the, you know, because of the staring and staring at inappropriate places. But I think for for me, it's just, yeah, those like really, really raw talks, like people that are going to go up there and talk about how like OCD ruined their marriage and how did they navigate through that and how are they now navigating a new what you know a new marriage with um their ocd managed or people talking there there's a I, I shouted her out yesterday in a meeting but there's an advocate um mckenzie and there's i need to memorize the gentleman's name but he also posts like some just really raw like low experiences so i think for people mm -hmm. with lived experience like don't be a don't ever think the conference is supposed to be where you go and talk about sunshines and rainbows i mean we definitely want that component we don't want people to leave thinking there's no hope but to, before you get to that end point of where you talk about like treatment, getting you better and that hope, I think just really being raw about like low moments and hard times and how'd you pick yourself out of that? I think for me as a clinician, I really want some like advanced talks for like very complex cases. What were some things that clinicians did when they had a client who's really struggling um, or was like housebound or, um, you know, uh, really struggling with medication and how to try some other modalities. So I just hope that people watching this, there's a lot of stuff. There's a good list too. If you go, um, I'll put the blog, uh, Brennan, in the back chat so you can put it publicly. But there's also a really good blog post that um, is up on the site that has some really good ideas. Um, I think that's the right link. So hopefully it is. But um, I was going to say definitely, I mean, especially at being or in Orlando, I think talks on diversity issues and multicultural issues are super important, not just because it's Orlando, but I think in general, one of the things that we're seeing at more and more conferences is we're starting to see people from all different um, backgrounds coming to conferences more than ever, whether it's people of color, whether it's people in the queer community, whether it's people with comorbidities like, you know, chronic illness, people of different face, we're seeing people come from rural areas, international areas. So definitely having talks like that. Um, we didn't mention perinatal OCD. I think that's something super, super important that we need some talks on as well. Um, mm -hmm. Don't forget OCD related disorders. I know the BDD, um, crew and the 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 bfrb crew and the hoarding crew is going to put some stuff up there but um i know that we've talked about vowel like this like ocd and aging is on that blog um so making sure that we want you know jesse talked about uh young adults stuff talked about the kids program but, but we want to hear people that maybe didn't get their treatment until their 60s or 70s and what that was like to live that whole life uh recovery life after recovery is important talk so you know, for people that are attending the conference that maybe have gotten really excellent um, care and are kind of wanting to, um, you know, figure out what's next for them. Like, what do they do after that? Um, we definitely already talked about kind of some research, some family stuff, policy advocacy. 
Uh, Justine will like that we're mentioning that. So what are some different um, ways to get involved on a political end um, to support OCD research, OCD grants, OCD support um, policy on a local, state, or national level? Oh, we didn't talk about this one, which I think is always a good one, like navigating insurance, disability, legal rights. Yeah, I was going to say the practicalities, for lack of a better word, of yeah. navigating life with OCD, the workplace issues, school-based issues, things like that are always super well attended. Yeah. And Jesse, y'all always kind of do that with, can you talk for a second about like navigating if people are watching, I think a really good talk is always about how to navigate the school system or like Steph mentioned, like the work system with having OCD. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, we did a talk called A New School Bully, getting the like creativity in there. Um, and we had a lot of different people on the panel. Like I worked in college admissions, someone worked in um, like high, being a high school counselor, we had Jacques, who is a therapist. You had, you know, a lot of different people. Everyone was a prior student in their life. Um, and a lot of people with lived experience with OCD. And school, you know, impacts, you know, everyone is, you know, experiences it. And OCD definitely finds its way into school life. So, yeah, that talk was really well attended. And we were able to hear a lot of different perspectives about, you know, OCD impacting school. And I think for family members, I mean, I, I know a lot of Chris Bear, shout out to Chris Bear, Susan Boaz, they've done a lot for that that space. Um, uh, <coughs> whoa, uh, I'm blanking on her name. You mentioned her at a meeting today, stuff, and it's driving me crazy. Um, who always does great stuff for kids, and she'll be at the kids camp. Um, is it Natasha? Yes, <laughs> Natasha, Natasha you're watching this. I'm so sorry. You're like my favorite person and your name totally blanked, Natasha Daniels. Um, but I think like the family stuff is super important too. So if you're mm -hmm. watching this as a parent, I mean, I always, what I hear from parents um, that go to the conference, because I get a lot of my clients' parents to go, what they always say is they love, love, love hearing from clinicians and they love hearing from parent experts, meaning you're an expert. You've been through this. You can talk about how did you deal with those late nights when your kid was up doing compulsions and you can't go to sleep because of guilt? How do you navigate and find treatment as a parent? So I think really talking about how to find a support system as a parent. So if you're a parent watching this, we love talks from parents, but also siblings, also from, from family members that are supporting a loved one that might not be a traditional parent. So maybe it's a, a neighbor who's who's been supporting a family or a grandparent that raised um, somebody with OCD, or um, there was a, a video that went viral about a kid that was talking about his mom's OCD. So I think we can even have talks, obviously, from kids that are growing up with a parent with OCD. So definitely, you know, all different, different experts, you know, in your own story. So making sure that people, I think those talks are exciting as well. Matt put in, and I love stuff like this because the young adults definitely do this. So Matt said at, at 728, we need to have a, um, our 12, uh, 725, we need to have a community IOCDF Mario Kart gaming tournament. We so, do. Yeah, I'm Toad and I destroy people in Mario Kart. So we will definitely play that. So that needs to happen. But that does need to happen. But I was going to segue into Jesse, like talking, and then I'm going to call on you, Steph, about evening activities, what kind of things to submit, because I think those are an easy way to start if you've never submitted before. An evening activity or even a support group is a good way to get your kind of feet wet. But for you, Jesse, like the young adults have like a game night. So can you talk a little bit about that and how that, that community was built through the different gaming and having fun? Yeah, absolutely. It's something we do a lot at our meetups, um, even like tomorrow we're going to have like we do a game room and anyone who wants to join the game room can do the game room. Um, I've learned there's a lot of like virtual games, um, which is pretty cool. But the in-person conference lets us do all those other games that, you know, you really can't play online. Um, so, yeah, there's the game um, game night. And then there was also the support group that was really cool, even as someone who's now met other people with OCD. Um, it was really cool to see other young adults who hadn't met any other young adults with OCD. And like, you kind of see like the change on their face when they're like, wow, like I'm not alone. And you see it in person, like right in front of you. And that's really cool. Yeah, no, I always love to see all the young adults together. And uh, I just do want to remember Kyle King, my team won in, uh, what was the game that the young adults played? We played, was it Scattergirls? Yeah, my team won, so I will always just play Kyle games. <laughs> it's it's um, a very competitive. Uh, they say everyone's all nice and stuff, but when you get to those game nights. 
<laughs> staff i think you know i was saying that in our meeting the other day i think like both evening activities and support, running support groups can be an easier way if people are feeling intimidated to do a talk. Um, besides the young adult stuff, what are some other evening activities that people have proposed? And sky's kind of the limit, but what are some of the the other things that you know go on at the conference that people can participate and present on? Yeah, definitely. So you know, I think we named a few you know more artistic types. We've had. Uh, you know, literally art activities, or if you're someone with other forms of creative expression, like we've had a poetry writing workshop, we've had a journaling activity, you know, or for folks who just want to write either creatively or, uh, you know, journaling type, non, non, I'm not really a writer, so nonfiction, I don't know what the right word to use is there. Um, karaoke has always been super popular. If there's one thing about the OCD community is they love a karaoke night. And I, that's one of my favorite things about us. Um, we've had, you know, people do runs and walks, maybe more walking in Florida, as we were saying, because of the weather. Um, one of the cool things I think that in recent years has been submitted is a meetup for people who are attending the conference solo. Uh, because I think that's something that's a very common experience for a lot of people. Um, they are coming alone and they might, this might be their first time and they might not know anybody yet. So I always love it when I see something like that submitted, because I think that's just a wonderful way for people to connect and meet each other early on. So I love seeing the solo attendee meetups. Um, yeah, I think there, there's honestly the sky's the limit, whatever you can dream and whatever you think you would like to do as a conference attendee. That's something that we want to see there. And that's something we want to add to enrich the experience that folks have. Yeah, Michael suggested something. Let's put that up at 746. He says, would there ever be interest in a book discussion type group? I'd love to do a discussion group on John Green's Turtles All the Way Down, for example. Yeah, you know what, Michael? I've seen a lot more on the clinician side is there's like virtual book clubs where people like clinicians have been meeting up. Um, I have Ben's book. Um, he, Ben E he just wrote a book on like how to stop worrying. And there's been a meeting on that. Um, so Michael, I think either a, you should submit that if you feel confident and you're going about a discussion group, um, for turtles all the way down and everyone remember, even though it's, if it's not, op even though it's not open yet, if you cannot attend the in-person, we hope you can, but if you can't attend the in-person, the online conference um, submissions will open up shortly. And that's an example of an, an activity that you could submit. But I do think that'd be cool to have people in a room all reading an OCD-based book and kind of vibing off of that. Did you read that book, Jesse? I did. That sounds so cool. I saw that comment. <laughs> I think that's yeah. an awesome idea. I read that one as well. Um, I'm going to throw up Cheryl's question at 747. For family who cares for OCD patients but are total enables, how to break the enabling cycle or get their family member to get much needed help? Parents getting older and can't keep it up. Yeah, Cheryl. I mean, I would say just obviously as a clinician, this is something that parents struggle with all the time. Speaking specifically on proposals, I think what's really good about this topic, um, I know that Barbara Van Oppen has done a um, family accommodations topic in the past where there's breakouts with different parents. But um, the good thing is I would say usually almost every year there's some submissions on this specific topic of like how as a parent to navigate supporting your loved one emotionally and really being there for them and supporting them and doing it in a way that absolutely supports this idea of like really not giving into the OCD, being a supportive, loving person without accommodating the OCD. So I promise you there'll be some talks. But again, one thing I wanted to bring up that that stuff can jump off of and, and Jesse as well. Let's say, Cheryl, for instance, you really were passionate about this topic and you wanted to submit it, but felt very lost of like who else to bring on that panel. There is an option to mark that you would like to be partnered up with other panelists. So you could yeah. submit a talk on this and say, look, like I really want to share like about uh, older parents, because I think that that's definitely a topic that hasn't actually been brought up a lot. I see it in my clinical practice where maybe parents are in their 60s or 70s with an adult child and they're really worried like as they get older and may not be able to support their loved one anymore with OCD, who's going to support them? Who's going to take over? Who's going to help? So if that isn't a topic that you, that you want, like Steph said, you could email the foundation, but let's say you have lived experience with this and want to be on a panel but don't have any clinicians you could join or don't know any other parents, there's an option to click that and the foundation's good at pairing people up. Yes, and we I highly encourage, and you know, as we started this discussion, as long as you yourself are ready to speak on it, whether you have anyone else to join you, that's still perfectly amazing for a submission. And then definitely do make sure to click that button that says you're open to being grouped with others. Because oftentimes we get a lot of 
uh, of things submitted from solo presenters who they want to be on a panel, but they just maybe they weren't as brave as Jesse was, you know, and reached doing the cold calling in advance, or they didn't even know where to start around that because I totally understand how overwhelming that could feel. Um, so oftentimes we have this whole pile of solo presentations and we start to see themes. We say, oh, hey, these three people want to speak on a similar theme. Let's group them together and make a panel. Um, there's a lot of kind of beautiful behind the scenes magic that happens in that vein. So so yes, don't let a lack of a panel already put together stop you. Just make sure when you submit, you do click that button and then we'll see what we can work um, once we have all the submissions in. And I know you think stuff, and I know Jesse, you kind of talked about it previously, but um, what were some things specifically that you did just to, or are doing in the future to kind of get other people to to join maybe panels? Yeah, I I can't get it out of my head. I keep thinking you're like Simon Cowell putting like one direction together. You're like getting all the, <laughs> all the individual. I, I think that's how it happened. I don't even know, but sorry, I, I couldn't get that out of my head. I I had to bring it up. Fun um, fact was Katie Perry, that was the deciding factor to let Niall Horan be in the group. So if it wasn't for Katie, we wouldn't have Niall. So wow, that's big. That's I didn't know that before. That is like shattering. So we we had to put that in there. That's the most important part of the stream. So wow, that is very cool. Um, <laughs> I've learned so much. Um, I would say, um, sorry, say your question again. It was about yeah, like when, when you, I mean, you talked a little bit about it, but now that you're submitting more and more, like how do you put groups of people together? Because I know like for me personally, most of the time it's already people I know and they mm -hmm. come to me or I sometimes come with them. But sometimes like for instance, there's uh, when I was really, really inspired um, by some, there was something I read about needing diversity. And I remember I was like, you know what? I don't ever see at the, the conference, like a panel of like a diverse panelist uh, that really work with different marginalized populations. And so I reached out to Dr. Jenny Yip, a colleague of mine here in LA. And I was like, look, I know you work with a lot of Asian and Asian American um, clients. I work with a lot of LGBTQ clients. We reached out, actually I reached out to you, Steph, and you linked us up with uh, Marcia Rubinowitz, who's down in Florida, who works with a lot of the Latinx population. And you uh, connected me with Jelani Daniel and one year uh, Darlene Davis, who works with the, the African American and black populations. And so, it was kind of like, you know, it was it was a little bit of like putting together. It was a lot of work just to get everybody on board, but it's doable if you really want to. So maybe Jesse, like for you, how do you get access to other people? It's so doable. And I think there are a lot of people who are connectors who will, you know, connect different people. Um, I know I had once been to a support group online that I, I didn't even realize I had the person's cell phone number. I guess we had exchanged cell phone numbers at one point and ended up um, reaching out to that person because they were a psychiatrist. And we were like, it would be really cool to have that medical background on a panel about chronic illness and had reached out to someone that way. Um, I think people will often share when you're in these OCD communities, um, a lot of things that they're passionate about within the OCD community. And just knowing that is really helpful in being able to bring someone on um, to your panel. All said. Uh, I wanted to bring up a new topic. I was looking at the blog about levels of difficulty. So I think that's important because one of the challenges, Steph, right? I, I would say like every year, it's almost like 50-50. We have like 50% mm -hmm. new people, 50% returning. So some new people don't even know what OCD is. And other people are like, they know what it is. They've presented. They've gone through their own treatment. They're in recovery. But we have to have content for them, too. So maybe to start with you, Steph, can you talk about like the levels of difficulty and give examples of what that would look like? So somebody submitting, what would be the criteria where they should, you know, their talk is a little bit more entry versus maybe something more advanced? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. This is also is, is something where I think a lot of talks can fall down if they don't accurately conceptualize their talk according to the level of difficulty they've chosen. Um, more often than not, we see talks that are billed as advanced that still for the first 10, 15 minutes are covering, how do you diagnose OCD? Um, so things like that, where if you're covering the basics, if, you're, if your talk has anything to do with the basics of what OCD is, how you identify it, how you treat it, things like that, that is almost always going to be a basic talk or an introductory level talk. If you're talking about, you know, how to adapt treatment to a certain population, you know, if you're a clinician or wanting to speak more into the mental health professional side, or if you're someone with a lived experience who had 
a really, you know, windy, twisty, turny journey. That's probably going to be more on the advanced side. Um, and there's no, again, there's no shame. There's no evaluation of good versus bad that happens between introductory or advanced. We just want our audience to know what they're getting into. Uh, Cause as Chris said, we do have, it's a very, very diverse and mixed audience who comes to our conference. People who have been coming for years who, you know, already know basically everything, but come because they love the community. Those are the folks who you gotta gear, you gotta um, you know gear these advanced talks towards, and then there's people who maybe only found out that they or someone in their family had OCD a week ago, and they happen you know to find out about this conference and came. They're gonna need a different type of information than the other person who's been coming for years. And we love and value everyone in our community, no matter how long you've been a part of it or you know what you're bringing to the table. So. It's, you know, I feel like I said the beauty and the challenge so often that's becoming my catch very slowly, but that's, you know, the beauty and the challenge of this conference is trying to make sure there is something for everyone and having the accurate assessment of what you're going to talk about helps with that. And again, it's doing a, an introductory talk is not anything to be ashamed of. That is such a vital part of this conference. And same thing with doing an advanced talk. We just, as long as you're honest about what you're what you're bringing to the table, that's all we ask. And we just want to be able to have our audience be able to be prepared and self-select. So the person who is new to OCD doesn't accidentally have an advanced talk on their hands and then they just feel so overwhelmed by information um, and like they've missed something, you know? So uh, it's just all about making the conference able to be best accessed by those who attend it. Yeah, and for thanks Steph. And for you, Jesse, um, like, you've been coming to the conferences and stuff talk maybe talk a little bit about like as somebody who's attended like the difference between maybe something intro you've gone to in advance you don't have to remember the name of the talks of course but like what does that feel like differently because i know for me going to the different talks uh you know i i, I over the years i've really wanted to learn more about uh treating bfrbs like skin picking hair pulling and i remember the intro talks a lot of like the theory a lot of the like definitions and stuff and then mar uh marla i always forget her last name so i love you marla but i i love your talks you but I'm butchering. Yeah. <laughs> thank you i uh, did an advanced talk at the online conference and it was a lot more advanced and i loved it so maybe as a attendee what does that feel like yeah i remember well so i'm studying social work so i was like oh i'll go to one of these like more advanced talks and see if I understand. Um, and a lot of it, like I understood just from like my own OCD treatment, um, but a lot of it I didn't, and that's why it's labeled advanced. Um, so I think, you know, you guys separate that out very well and it's, it's pretty clear um, what's what. I remember too, um, I know there was one, see, I, I'm not gonna remember the name, but there was one that was about like sleep and it was like a very like sciencey one. I don't, Steph, you're nodding. I don't know if you know which one I'm talking about. Yeah, like biopharma, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Like all the mm -hmm. fancy words. Yeah. So I, I didn't personally attend that one um, because I stay away from biopharma, like all the fancy stuff. Um, but I know a friend had gone and was like, yeah, that totally went over my head, but it was fascinating. So, you know, I think you can self-select and if things are really interesting, like the topic, you can still gain stuff out of it, even if you don't understand like all of the nuanced uh, parts of it. And what I'll just throw out there on the clinician end, I mean, I think for clinicians that have attended the conference a lot and maybe present, uh, there's a lot of new clinicians coming up in OCD treatment. So if you're a clinician that treats OCD, you've been doing it consistently for years, you, you feel confident speaking, there is a hunger for people to learn more of those uh, beginning topics mm -hmm. like ERP 101. What are some of the pitfalls that you, know, you, you started out that you can kind of guide people um, through? Where can you find advanced or find more trainings? And then I would say for me, going to the conferences of the year, I always am hungry for more advanced talks. So I think clinicians watching this live stream, uh, either live or watching it back, there's definitely a need for really, really advanced talks. Um, you know, like on the psychiatry end, like what do you do if somebody's tried three or four different medications and haven't really, really worked out or on an OCD side? Like what if somebody is really struggling in and out of like a rehab situation or substance abuse, substance use disorders, but have severe OCD that's causing the substance use. And how do you, you know, those are the hungry talks that I think people want. So definitely, definitely thinking of 
of advanced talks for people. There's a lot of hungry uh, therapists that want that. Uh, I want to put, put up Matthew Bannister's comment at 747. Hearing recovery stories from hitting rock bottom is so empowering. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is because like we were saying earlier, please, 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 if you're watching this and you have OCD and like Steph said, you're ready to talk. These are the kind of talks people want to hear. And what I've heard from people sometimes is they're like, ooh, I don't know if like my story is appropriate because it was really, really some dark moments. And obviously we don't want to trigger the audience, but um, presenting your story in a way that definitely makes people feel really if they're at a real low. Um, I wanted to move to the next question. I kind of put this one. This one isn't as specific, but what are some like just general do's and don'ts? Like what are some things that we've been talking a lot about maybe the do's. So maybe we could start with like some, from a non-judgmental place. Like what are some of the don'ts that, you know, maybe people have a good topic, but just don't get selected because they keep doing some of the don'ts. Or yeah. any do's that you're like, these really make it stand uh, aside. Yeah, no, I think you're right in that we have mainly focused on the do's. Um, so when I think of some of the don'ts, it's, it's almost harder to think of those because it's one of those, there's fewer, I guess, hard and fast rules around the don'ts. Um, not that there's hard and fast rules around the do's, but it's just, it's sometimes harder to think of the don'ts. I think one thing for sure is we don't really want self-promotion. Um, so if you're, the only point of your talk is to maybe you just wrote a book and you want to sell the book, then we're probably not going to select that. And that's not to say if you didn't write a book, you're still welcome to mention it in another talk or, you know, include it in your bio and things like that. But we don't ever want to talk that's only about this book that you want to sell. Um, so, or whatever other example you can think about uh, where, you know, the sole purpose of the talk is to sell a good or a service. Um, this, cause this really is a place where people are coming to learn and to connect um, so we, we really try to steer away from things like that. Um, I think another don't is if you're talking about, uh, and this maybe is more on the clinician side, but if you're talking about a type of treatment that research has shown does not work for OCD or is actively harmful for OCD, we will not be accepting that because, you know, the foundation solidly follows the science and, um, you know, the conference is no different from that. Um, I think, you know, an easy example of something we know doesn't really work for OCD is a uh, crystal healing. I hope that's <laughs> not too controversial to say, but we likely will not have a, we would never have a talk about crystal healing at the online OCD or at the online or the annual OCD conference um, because we know that does not work for OCD. Um, so things like that, I think are some of the clear, more clear don'ts I can think of. Yeah. Yeah, some other don'ts that come to my mind is, you know, the foundation when Steph and the team really went above and beyond to create a submission panel or submission button for lived experience. So if you're submitting your 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 story, really kind of map out like, hey, these are the subtypes. This is where I got treatment, when I got treatment. This is what my treatment looked like. This is what my recovery looks like. Because some we don't we don't always know you. So if you're submitting and you're like, hey, I got better from OCD, I want to share my story that's not really helpful. I think vagueness isn't helpful either. Remember, you may know and love your topic, but the people that are, um, you know, are, are reviewing it, or if it gets selected, the people that are going to choose to go to your talk, if it's too vague, they just don't know it. Um, yeah. Also, yeah, like you said, I, I remember there's some submissions on like hypnotism and stuff. Please don't, <laughs> don't do that per se. Um, and also like, don't, the, 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 the conference doesn't pick solo speakers. So sometimes people will be a solo speaker and say they're not open to working with other people. And, um, you know, that's that's not a talk that really gets selected. So I think those are some some little do's to definitely, you know, make make sure not to. Jesse, when you're putting together panels, is there any don'ts that you're like, we got to make sure not to do this that you could share with people? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I don't know. I think the big thing for us was having like a therapist on board um, mm -hmm. and not just like, you know, being able to have that experience um, from the other side um, and being able to have, you know, different perspectives, like you said, like not just like one of us going up there and, and telling our story, but really being able to um, hear from others. We also really wanted to include like, as you were saying, Steph, like a lot of the research to kind of like back up what we were saying. Um, so we weren't just like spewing things out there. 
Yeah. Well, I'm going to put up a couple more comments from people because I think if you're watching this and coming up with topics, this is what the public wants. So let's put up <laughs> Betsy's comment, Brennan, at 749. Betsy says, don't forget about the people over 50 who did not have much available at all. Growing up, therapy was just not available. I, I agree with this, Betsy. I think if you're somebody that's submitting a talk, whether you're a clinician or a person with lived experience, you know, like I said, there's a lot of really great youth programming and we want to make sure people um, that did not receive treatment younger even let's say you did receive treatment um, when you're younger but it's still something that you're navigating in your 50s 60s etc i think that's super important i think both as talks uh from a clinician lens a lived experience lens support group would be a great idea heck a meetup would be pretty awesome too so please 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 don't be afraid of that i think another good topic let's put up brennan at uh, 750 from cheryl is about how to get insurances to cover so we talked about that a little bit and as uh as uh steph said you know really kind of prioritizing access to care so that'd be really good this one will definitely give uh steph a stroke but amy at uh 751 says sounds like we need a three or four week conference lots of way ocd can affect us so i don't know if we're there yet but i think adding days isn't necessarily uh <laughs> so, i don't know if you're ready for a four week conference um, one topic I wanted to bring up, Steph, and how to navigate this, because I'm even kind of curious. I know we put on the blog, like, do mix it up from previous years. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like, you know, because there's 50% new and some talks just do extremely well. How does somebody, let's say somebody did a talk, it was super well, like, how does somebody resubmit that in a way that it feels fresh enough to get selected um, because it was so well received? Yeah, I think, you know, some ways to mix it up are to see if maybe there's a section of the talk that you can change to be about a new topic. So not the entire talk, but maybe a section about it, um, maybe a different point to cover versus one the one you covered in previous years. Another way is to potentially, if you're not at max capacity, add a new panelist or switch out one of the panelists to have that fresh perspective. Um, and we, we really do strive to find the balance because it, exactly as you're saying, Chris, there are some talks that are just so incredible that they are worth repeating just because people are going to get so much benefit out of them, even if it was on last year. And we always want to make sure to have fresh content. So it's it's this it's a it's a real balancing act. And, you know, I will be super upfront that we don't always get it right. And that's why we always want to hear from you guys. The evaluations are we read every single one. They're so important and they really do help shape. The conference experience. So sorry, I know I went on a little tangent there, but hopefully that was answering your original question. Yeah. Yeah. No. Also, I was thinking about it. Like, for instance, like you know, with um, the diversity talk that I mentioned earlier, we had submitted it. It was really well attended and well received. And we were mm -hmm. like, shoot, we want to do it again because we got such feedback and people liked that the diversity wasn't like one. Uh, you know, one focus, it was focused on all different like uh, marginalized groups. So the next year we came back and we did it as case studies. So all of us pulled like real <laughs> cases of a client and we went through that process. Like how did um, DEI based care, how did that positively impact the client if they didn't receive it and using real clients that obviously signed okay and we changed uh, identifying information. But my point is like reaching out to a different group. So I think sometimes like that is like, how do you revamp it a little bit? But like, Jesse, this would be a good question to ask you, because a lot of times for the young adult talks, for instance, like taking out a college based class would be kind of a disaster because I think that's so important. But how do you shake it up? So if somebody has gone to the young adult talks and I've heard people talk about college, it's still interesting enough that um, people want to return. You know, people are in college four years, maybe seven if they're going to grad school. So they're, they're, they're continuing to want more information on that. How do you kind of spice it up a little bit so that it's still a relevant topic that's needed for that track, but, you know, has a different component to it for sure? I think that's a great question. And I think it's something, too, that we're trying to get right. Um, I think it's like Steph was saying, adding in different perspectives and different people who have different positions in the school realm and thinking about that topic um, or different, whenever you have someone else who's had a completely different experience, I'm thinking also we did a talk about work, like transitioning from school to work. And on that, I had a really great experience where I loved work because I didn't have all my compulsions with school, whereas someone else hated work 
because they had more compulsions with work than school. So just kind of having those like wildly different perspectives from some people with lived experience are kind of a way to make it a little different. Yeah, I think sometimes adding different panelists or like I said, like making it more advanced or, um, you know, making it more interactive. Like sometimes people need that first year where it's just introducing the topic. But then like I'm thinking chronic illness, right? I have two I have two autoimmune diseases that impact my 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 um, energy, my anxiety and stuff. So I think for me, like going the first year, just learning about it. But then if I return, like what are specific tangible things that in the audience I could kind of like take down, create a plan. So when I leave, so you know, always kind of make exactly it what we've been working on doing right now. We're like, how do we okay. make this? And just, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're on the same page, Chris. Steph, another point on the blog, and I know you talked about it earlier in a meeting about youth programming, submitting to that. So uh, I know the youth, they, there's a lot of youth. So what are some opportunities for people to submit? What are some things that if somebody's watching this and, and, and is looking like, yeah, I'd love to submit some youth programming. What is something specific that that's, uh, uh, is looking for the youth? Yeah, we, you know, we we have the uh, youth rooms for the three age groups. We have the elementary schoolers, the middle schoolers, and the high schoolers. And all three age groups have activities on all three days and including in the evenings as well. It's largely the same categories we talked about earlier with the more educational workshops, the support groups, and the more fun activities. Uh, the difference being, and we sort of mentioned it as well when we were talking components, we do require that any workshop for the youth room has an experiential element. So whether it's they're going to be practicing something or, you know, talking in groups about a topic or, you know, making some sort of creative piece about whatever the topic might be, uh, we just know we, we can't have our the youngest members of our community sitting in a, basically a classroom for several hours. Um, they get enough of that at school. We want them to come, you know, have a good time at the uh, annual OCD conference. Um, and, you know, we the the cool thing about the youth rooms is, you know, obviously similar to the rest of the conference. If you're someone with a lived experience, it's a really cool opportunity to have a little bit of a mentorship almost where you can see those with OCD who are, you know, younger than you and kind of maybe just starting out or just in an earlier phase and, you know, share your wisdom. Say when I was your age, this is what it was like for me. And now, you know, especially in the high school room, I know things like that go over so well um, hearing from the lived experience advocates. Um, and then, you know, obviously mental health professionals can uh, have a place there. The parents and the guardians and the caretakers have a place there. And I think a lot of times some of the best activities come from people who are teachers or who are former camp counselors or who have those sorts of experiences that they can bring to the table to create just you know, we sometimes even do think of the annual OCD conference. It's not called the camp, like the camp at the end of the month is, but it does have a very camp-like structure. So that's, if that's an experience you have, what, what regardless of whatever your other credential may or may not be, that is something that you can bring to the table for the youth rooms. Um, and then the other little caveat about the youth rooms is, while majority are youth who have OCD, we do have a lot of family members of those with OCD, such as siblings, um, or as Chris mentioned earlier, the children of adults who have OCD. So um, it, we try to also make sure the youth rooms are inclusive of all those experiences and not only geared towards youth with OCD. We want people to be, we want the, the little, I, I like to call them the kidlets, but we want the kidlets to be able to come and have a good time. And, you know, no matter who they are, how they identify, be able to, you know, find that connection community and maybe even learn something if we're lucky. Well said. A couple more ideas for those of you watching that are struggling with topics. There was definitely a comment earlier about international resources. So there's, you know, it's the International uh, OCD Foundation. So if you're watching this and you're an international individual with OCD family or clinician or researcher, um, please, please, please submit something. We want to hear international voices. I know at the online conference, um, we had uh, the gentleman from Israel who has done, they were the ones that identified relationship OCD as a subtype. I think it was Guy Duran um, mm -hmm. and, and spoke. So uh, we love hearing voices. We had some uh, clinicians from uh, Canada, from Australia. So definitely if you're, if you're someone international, please do not be afraid to submit. This is an international conference. Um, Janet uh, Brennan at 754 wrote, how do you find a support group for older OCD sufferers where we have struggling finding support? So that's uh, Matt gave some great advice. Definitely connect with Val Andrews. And like we said, go to iocdf.org slash find help. 
But for those of you that are looking to submit talks, I mean, I think finding a support group for older OCD sufferers is great. I also think parents of older OCD sufferers would be a great support group if somebody needs a topic to submit. I think there's a lot of parents that have adult children with OCD. So if you're mm -hmm. stuck on topics, we're giving you some good ones that the people want. Um, I wanted to also throw out a couple more things because I look at the time and I have way too many more questions, but I'm, I want to pick a couple important ones. If somebody doesn't get selected stuff, how do they not get discouraged? How do they not think it was personal or feel really bummed out? Um, because I think sometimes people don't recognize. Um, I'm hoping today's live stream obviously will help make it more likely, but how do people not get discouraged? Yeah, I would, I would say reach out to us and we're happy to give you kind of specific feedback about your talk and maybe the reasons why or wh why it was not accepted and maybe some suggestions for the future for if you do choose to do it again. And so there's, you know, an element of that where if maybe knowing the understanding the reasons behind it and not just thinking it was some arbitrary decision that these big old meanies at the IOCDF made. Um, but of course, I don't mind if you call me an old meanie, I will accept that. Um, but then also, I think there is just, it's, it's a numbers game, because, you know, last year, for example, we had almost 700 proposals, and we're only able to accept just space wise about 125 to 150. So, you know, if, if it's a numbers game in that way, sometimes we have to, it's agonizing, frankly, and Chris, you can attest to this, where we have the most beautiful proposal and we really, 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 really want to accept it, but we don't have a room to put it in because we've already maxed out. So sometimes, and you know, that's what we will tell you when you reach out to us, we'll say if that is the situation for your talk, um, you know, we'll say this probably hurts us as much as it hurts you to not have accepted it because we really loved it and we wanted to have it. Um, that happens more often than I'd care to admit. It's my least favorite part of this whole process is the fact that we can't accept everybody. Um, so I think, you know, maybe a little bit of both. I think just knowing the reasons of behind it, and we're always going to be happy to share that with you. So never hesitate to reach out. Um, and just also accepting that there is an element of a numbers game, frankly. Um, yeah. And Jesse, how do you, um, how, how have you dealt with if, if, Maybe all of your talks have gotten selected, but how have you? No, not they haven't. I so okay, I wanted then. to add on to yes, what, and that in. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to add on to what Steph was saying because I remember submitting two talks for the online conference that didn't get selected, and I was like, oh dang. Um, and then when I got to the online conference, I was like, thank God, this would have been embarrassing. <laughs> like compared to the, you know, when you get there, you see just the amazing talks that are there. And, you know, it'll sting because, you know, you put it into Grammarly and once you put it into Grammarly, you're, you're, you know, you're with it. Um, but honestly, it's once you see the amazing talks that are there um, and hearing with all the numbers game, I think it's always helpful to hear how many talks there are because it really puts things in perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think being helping with the process, it, it, it's a lot of times it's not that the talks are bad. It's just there isn't another day or there's already talks that are similar um, or it makes more sense for a different conference. That sometimes happens. We had a couple mm -hmm. people applying for like kid talks and stuff and it made more sense for the, the kids conferences. So that's the other thing to think about. If you have a specific talk, let's say you submitted a BDD talk or a um, hoarding talk, don't be afraid to reach out to the conference or any of the conference planning people people um, and say, hey, like, you know, do you need another hoarding talk? The other thing I wanted to add on there, Steph, you could, uh, you know, talk about a little bit more. If they submit an, uh, for this conference that doesn't get selected, is it an option to resubmit to online? Is that an option for them? It is, yes, in most cases. We don't have all of the same tracks for the online OCD conference as we do for the in-person. So there's some aspects. So for example, the youth is actually a great example of that where the youth are at the annual OCD conference, but not the online OCD conference because they're at the online OCD camp. So it's not always a one-to-one -one connection in that way, but for the most part, yes, please, of course. And I think, you know, we will always say that to you as well. Like, please, you know, it's, take your chance every year, every year that your heart can take it. And every year that you're willing and able, we'd love to have, you know, your ideas and you never know. Yeah. Uh, Phyllis put up there at um, 822. Um, I could speak about the old days when there's no ERP and no meds, but it's too depressing. You know what, Phyllis? I think I'm the reason I picked your, your comment 
you know, there was a talk I did with Liz McInvell and with um, Riley Sisson's mom, Margaret, and we talked about like OCD and depression, suicidality and substance use. I think it's how you present it. You know, I think this could be an inspirational talk about having a panel of people of different ages and going through like what it's been like to get treatment at different stages. I know I would be very fascinated to to see a talk of people talking about what it was like pre because I think it motivates us to recognize just how far we came. Uh, Matt at 816 put up self-compassion and value-driven ERP presentations are awesome. Yes, I think ERP and ACT talks are really, really good ones. Um, people are talking about, uh, there's another topic idea for some of y'all at 814 about spiritual healing. It's really beneficial for learning how to meditate um, anxiety levels when I'm in ERP because meditative states and energy cleansing is good for recovery. Yeah, some people really find maybe they're not faith-based, but spirituality, mindfulness, meditation. Um, Kelly, if we could put her comment up at 813, um, have a session on sensor motor e uh, OCD. I mean, I think that's a really good one. A lot of people struggle with the fixation of their breathing or their swallowing. And this one is a, is a particularly um uh has unique challenges as a subtype because often it's less about a, a core fear and more just about absolute torture of being so hyper focused on some of your um just general functioning that most people ignore so i think that is important um kelly also says what about at uh 812 what about uh sessions on latest re research particularly interested in tms and glutamate research um, can you talk a little bit about that stuff? Because there is the research posters that people can attend and there's always food too. So that's why I'm always excited to, to visit them. But we have a lot of talks on the latest research that Kelly might be interested in. Yeah, we so I always encourage people to visit the the posters um, and especially the session, not even just because the free food, but because it's such a cool opportunity to talk to the people who are doing this research and hear from their mouths and their brains what they're doing and why it's important. It's just such a really cool opportunity at the research posters. Um, but in addition to that, we actually have a whole track that is called Emerging Trends, New Directions. Uh, for those of you who have been around for a while, you'll notice that that is the former research to clinical practice track. Um, but that whole track, which runs through all three days of the conference, is specifically geared towards sharing the latest research, although specifically with an eye towards how we can apply it to either our lives or our daily practice or whatever it might be. So uh, it's all about, you know, the jargony term for is that is translational science. It's all about taking the things these researchers are finding in their studies and making it actually out into the world and not just you know, stuck in the ivory tower, as they often say about research, where they're making all these cool findings, but then it, nobody knows about it. And the, therefore, nothing is changing because they don't know about these updates. Um, so I encourage you, if you do come to the conference, to check out that track, particularly, because that's where you're going to find all those cool talks about the latest and greatest that's happening in the research world. Very, very true. And then uh, another comment was, what about a topic on maintaining a proactive recovery lifestyle and mindset mm -hmm. after treatment? Those those talks kind of like life after recovery is really, really helpful. Uh, there was another shout out by Emily for uh, Worrying is Optional by Ben Eckstein. So yes, mm -hmm. that book's good. Um, sometimes there's uh, authors of these books at the conference, so you could go up to them. Um, there was a couple questions not about the conference. Um, Kathleen, you asked about your son has bad skin picking and hair pulling. What help should I look for? Um, please, please, please go to um, iocdf.org slash find dash help. Uh, maybe Brendan could put it up on there. Um, what you're going to want to look for is the good news, Kathleen, just like if you come to the conference, that's known as a BFRB or body focused repetitive behavior. And there's talks about that at the conference as well as um, there is clinicians that specialize in OCD. This is an OCD related disorder. So all of us that treat OCD are really experts in this. Um, so you can find someone based on your zip code and find help. And Brittany, you asked a similar question, Brittany P about needing somebody to in Florida to work with your 23 year old daughter with severe OCD. I know there's the NBI, which is a really good program down there. I mentioned Marcia Rabinowitz, who's down in Florida. So please, for anybody that's looking for help for a loved one, I know this talk was, uh, this uh, live stream was much more about um, proposing for the conference, but that's what's also great about this uh, foundation is you can definitely find help. Um, Brennan just put that in the chat. So please, um, like I said, a, a BFRB is an OCD related look up your zip code and and make sure that a clinician near you treats that as well as for for um 
uh, severe OCD, there's going to be help out in Florida. Uh, before we go, because I just realized we're a little over time, I want to give you two guests uh, the final words. So Jesse, final word for people that are thinking about proposing, what is some good um, kind of final thoughts you could leave people with? I, I, okay, I thought you were going to change it a little and, and ask about the conference. Can I answer that, that question? Wait, what did I say that wasn't about the conference? No, 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 about like attending the conference as opposed to proposing for the conference. Yeah, if you want to talk about attending it, you can too. Okay, sweet. Um, I, I was just going to say that it, it is truly like the most magical experience and it's an experience unlike any other. Um, and also proposing a, um, a conference talk and like being able to be around people, like you were saying, who have written the books, who have done the research themselves. I remember even seeing like, I'm gonna embarrass myself, but like seeing Chris in person or seeing, I heard someone say they'd much rather see Ethan Smith than Taylor Swift in person <laughs> after they met Ethan, which I feel like too, for the record. Um, but like being around all the people who are doing the work and who know OCD treatment so well um, is just really, really awesome. Well, thank you. Very sweet words. You're, you're really appreciated. And for you, Steph, final thoughts. I think my final thought is I encourage everyone who feels comfortable speaking to propose. Um, and I'm going to butcher the quote, but this is your chance to build the conference you wish to see in the world. So apologies to, I believe, is that Eleanor Roosevelt? I believe originally the be the change you wish to see in the world. Yeah. But this is your build the conference you wish to see in the world. Um, and so, you know, if you've ever attended a conference and are like, hey, I wish there was a talk on XYZ topic now's your chance to propose XYZ topic. Um, and, you know, again, if you're not comfortable uh, speaking on XYZ topic, then that's a shoot us an email and we'll make sure it's on the radar. But this is your chance. And I strongly encourage you, urge you, invite you, welcome you to take that chance. Well said, you two. Yes, please, please, please submit. submit submissions are open until January 29th. So I, I, I think the best thing, kind of what I tell my clients when they're afraid of doing something, Go on the website, open up, look at the submission process. Sometimes our brains, especially with OCD, can make up stories about scary things that aren't always true. So make sure you can kind of look at the submission process, go through it, and just see if it's something you're confident about. Um, if you're a parent with a, a, a loved one with OCD that's doing better, talk to them. Maybe you could do a talk together. So definitely check it out. Um, the other thing I was going to say is don't forget, you could always volunteer at the conference or obviously attend as well mm -hmm. as a guest and kind of see what talks are there. But I think volunteers, they really get to kind of see the behind the scenes. They get to be mm -hmm. there. They get to sit in talks. Uh, and sometimes those volunteers get encouragement and then end up deciding to speak as well. So definitely, mm -hmm. definitely, definitely. We we need y'all. That, that's what makes the conference so well each year is getting new voices and then having other voices come back and um, proposing new talks and and just we really need that so um yes uh we got some good comments some nice comments um a combo final thought announcements don't forget tomorrow's live stream will be with john abramowitz and kyle king it's going to be research roundtable so definitely definitely make sure uh that you attend that that is at 9 a.m pacific uh noon eastern so that will be the live stream tomorrow uh, also don't forget that uh the camp registration is open so register register today to join the special event for youth with ocd and their families so go to iocf.org slash camp uh make sure if you're watching this on youtube or facebook uh, we're going to soon be on Instagram, I think, um, or X or Twitter. Make sure you subscribe, um, you know, subscribe. So that way it pops up for you and you could always watch these and you can always see uh, the entire schedule of what live streams are coming up. So go to iocdf.org slash live streams. There's a couple questions about specifically about care. Um, and we gave you the iocdf.org slash find dash help. But Liz McInvale and myself run the clinical live streams, um, the first, uh, first, third and fourth. Uh, Wednesday of every month at nine um, Pacific noon Eastern. So come to that and we can ask your uh, answer your questions more in depth. Um, and then lastly, make sure you sign up uh, for IOCDF news and updates at IOCDF.org slash sign dash up. And always please uh, go to IOCDF.org for more information for everything. And if you want to uh, want to donate to a nonprofit, that's amazing. Uh, go to IOCDF.org slash donate. I want to thank my guest today, uh, I really think that this is something that can really, really, really 
uh, be useful if you're thinking about submitting for the conference. And if you're not ready to talk yet, please, please come. The conferences are great. And like we said, we have a bunch year round. Uh, head over to iocf.org for all of your support with OCD and related disorders. And we appreciate you all for coming out, hanging out and supporting each other in the comments. A good bye to everybody from the West Coast and from the East Coast. Take care, everyone. Thank you.